Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Richard Chernock. Uh, Rich is the Chief Science Officer at Trevini Digital in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, prior to Trevini, uh, Rich was a research staff member at IBM Research investigating digital broadcast technologies. Rich's doctorate is from MIT in the field, believe it or not, of nuclear materials engineering. Dr. Chernock is overall chairman of the ATSC technology group on ATSC 3.0, call that TG3, and also chairs the ad hoc group on service delivery and synchronization. Prior to his work on ATSC uh, 3.0, he was chair of ATSC's other technology group, TG1. Dr. Chernock was the 2001 recipient of the ATSC prestigious Lechner Award. He is also the distinguished lecturer, lecturer chair for the IEEE Broadcast Technology Society. See if I can navigate this correctly. Uh, so looking at this layer diagram, we're going to move up one now into what's called protocols here. Uh, essentially, this is the plumbing. The bits and the bytes, how you get stuff from hither to yon. Uh, I'm going to go through a bunch of detail on this. For some strange reason, my brain is wired to like this kind of stuff, so I, I think it's fun. Uh, so this is all about transport. Um, transport, just in general, what do you need? What does transport do for you? So digital television is made up of a number of objects and streams. You have content elements, audio, video, you have files, you have metadata blobs. You've got to be able to take all of this, segment it into usable sized pieces, and this all depends upon the kind of pipe you're sending it along. And whatever you do to it to send it, you've got to be able to undo it at the other end, reassemble everything, and make it usable. Uh, besides that, you also have to be able to associate components with services. It's kind of nice if the video for one show is actually uh, presented with the audio from the same show instead of from a different show. Uh, and you've got to be able to synchronize everything. Um, hopefully the days of lip sync problems are in the past. And you've got to be able to do all of this no matter how you deliver. Uh, there's also another aspect now. Um, originally, television was all real time. It was broadcast, you watched it. We've come up with the notion of non real time, of pushing content out to the TV, to the receiving device in advance and consuming it when it's needed. When the viewer wants it, when it is, is synchronized with the program, something like that. So we've got to be able to deal with both real time and non real time in ATSC3. Uh, and this could be application files, targeted ads, emergency information, any different, any number of different types of things. So if you look back at history a little bit, look at ATSC 1.0 when we went digital. This was all based on the MPEG-2 transport stream. Uh, very successful technology, did what it needed to do very well, very flexible. Uh, and it really gave capabilities for program multiplexing, being able to mix different programs in a single transmission, uh, match up clocks, essentially match the encoder clock to a decoder clock so things could be presented at the right time. This is a key to audio video synchronization. And then there was a bunch of metadata that made it actually usable by people who knew how to watch TV but didn't didn't need to get trained for this new digital thing. They could operate the way they used to, program guides and the like. Next step was to add a mobile DTV layer. Uh, and the reason I'm putting this up here is this w was sent in conjunction with ATSC 1.0, but the transport for the mobile DTV portion was based on IP instead of MPEG-2 transport. So this is the first step away from MPEG-2. Uh, there was ATSC 2.0, which was a backwards compatible way of enhancing the original DTV broadcast, uh, adding 
use of return channel from, through the internet, adding non-real-time use of local storage, and then adding advanced codecs. Um, ATSC3 work started up as ATSC2 was being developed and actually overtook it. So we learned a lot with ATSC2, but the timing wasn't right to really deploy this because ATSC3 was around the corner with many more capabilities as Skip had outlined. So if we look at, step back, look at ATSC1, Back when we did ATSC-1, again, as Skip showed, there was TV and there was a little bit of other stuff, but the internet wasn't an entertainment platform yet. Uh, so TV was really a silo. It was a form of providing entertainment. An MPEG-2 transport stream was great for that. Lots of flexibility as a standalone. It was wonderful, worked really well. But as the internet came along, as entertainment happened across the internet, MPEG-2 became a problem because it's very, very difficult to integrate things delivered over MPEG-2 transport and things delivered over broadband using IP. It can be done, it has been done in some places, but what you have to do is extremely tortuous. It's very, very difficult. So for ATSC3, we decided, well, let's not do that again. <clears throat> let's make broadcasting effectively part of the internet. Uh, so we decided to use internet protocol transport. Uh, one of the key reasons was because of the ability to integrate broadband, hybrid things, uh, make it part of the internet, but also to allow it to evolve at the speed of the internet. Things on the internet evolved very, very quickly. Broadcasting in the past had always been a very slow plotting type of evolution comparison. Uh, all kinds of new things. Encryption, conditional access, DRM, uh, monetization. Broadcasting is a business. Broadcasters would kind of like to be able to buy food at home. Uh, so these are all big aspects for, uh, for the future of broadcasting. And then file delivery. File delivery kind of sounds ho-hum, but this NRT and pushing files is really important for lots of things. VOD, um, early satellite systems provided video on demand in a one-way system by pushing the files, planting them in the home, people could watch them. Broadcasters can do the same. Ad insertion, which I'll get into. Dynamic ad insertion. <coughs> being able to push things is very important. Uh, so the key elements of the management layer, the protocol layer, are, and these are big, big changes. First off, the use of internet protocol transport. ATSC 3.0, while it can support other things, everything that's in there is designed to use IP. Second thing is the use of what's called ISO BMFF, ISO based media file format, for streaming delivery. <clears throat> Previously, streaming was sending streams of bits. It essentially didn't stop. ISO BMFF is segmented delivery, sending chunks of streams that are played sequentially. If you look at video delivery over the internet, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, so on, this is how it's all done. When you're watching something on YouTube or Netflix, you're getting a segment of the content. You watch it. <clears throat> Before the segment ends, you get the next segment. In the internet, this is all dynamic. It's based on your connection speed. Uh, what comes next may actually be a different resolution if your connection falters. But the internet delivery of video is based on this. A uh, big important step um, lots of things change, lots of things become possible and much easier. Um, at the bottom you see an ISO BMFF file. It's composed of a bunch of little boxes. Uh, boxes are chunks of either metadata or content. Uh, and you see different segments. Um, in this particular case, HTTP, as you probably know, is a two-way protocol. In a broadcast system that's one way, that's a little bit awkward. So what's actually happening is segments are pushed into the receiver 
is an HTTP proxy that talks to a conventional dash client and plays these up. Key thing there is conventional dash client. The same client can grab stuff off the internet as is playing stuff delivered through broadcast. Uh, the actual transport for this is something called route, real-time object delivery over unidirectional transport. These acronyms are getting really, really strained. They don't work very well. Uh, if you're into this kind of stuff, uh, there's something called flute, which is used for file delivery in a multicast environment. Um, flute is another acronym that doesn't work very well. Uh, route is really a broadcast friendly enhancement of Flute. Uh, it does a number of things that make it better for the broadcast world. It's actually based on some work in 3GP, 3GPP MBMS. Um, it runs over ELC, again, alphabet soup. It's a <coughs> protocol. Uh, it's, it's a transport protocol for TV files. Uh, one of the things that Route does is enables early playout of segments. You don't have to get the entire segment to begin playing it, which makes a big difference for channel change. Um, optimization of delivery, extension, extended uh, FTT, which is essentially directory. Lots of little tweaks that make it much better for broadcast. Uh, the other transport that's here is something is MMT which uses a media processing unit, which is a slightly different variant of an ISO BMFF file. Uh, it's got a different brand. That's the term they're using for the type, essentially. Uh, different boxes, a few different constraints, single media track. There's a constraint on the order of the media, of the sample data. The uh, MPUs are all self-contained. You don't need anything else to start playing. And there's a hint track for media awareness. One way to think of this is that route dash is a bit more like internet delivery and MMT, MPU, MPD, or is more like MPEG. So it depends on where you're coming from, what your preferences are, which determines which you might choose. Uh, MMT is delivered over MPEG Media Transport Protocol. It's an alternative to route. Uh, it's defined by MPEG, um, carries the MPU-based ISO BMFF files. Uh, it's kind of similar to TS and RTP. Uh, it does support multiplexing, media aware packetization, and so on. There is a buffer model, uh, and there's a way to remove jitter uh, jitter can come in depending on how this is delivered. Uh, MMTP is used in Japan as part of the super high vision standard. Synchronization. Uh, synchronization is a big deal. Um, lip sync is the best example. Lip sync problems have existed forever in television. They become more prominent in uh, digital TV because of some mistakes that were made. But if you dig back into history, analog TV had lip sync issues as well. Uh, you've got to synchronize things. You've got to synchronize the video. You've got to synchronize the audio. When the lips move, the sound should be emitted. There's other components that need to be synchronized as well. Captions, for example. It's not quite as tight, but it needs to be done. It's tougher in the 3.0 world because you have to synchronize no matter how things are delivered. If video is delivered over broadcast and audio is delivered over broadband, you have to be able to synchronize them. Uh, yeah, if the content is streamed and some of it is prefetched, pushed, you've got to be able to synchronize that. The way it's been done in the past was on a per program basis. You basically recreated the encoder clock and the decoder. Um, things worked. It's not so easy with the different paths and different sources. So in ATSC 3, we've gone to a single universal time based on UTC. The entire system knows what time it is exactly. This provides the timeline necessary to do the synchronization. The interesting thing is, depending on where you are in the system, there are different requirements for time. Luke mentioned single frequency networks. These work by essentially emitting the same signals, symbols, 
from all transmitters at exactly the same time. You need something like nanosecond accuracy for that. Eh, give or take. It's good. You need much better accuracy for that than you do to synchronize audio and video. This single time system provides all of that. It'll provide what you need for SFN synchronization as well as lip sync as well as everything else. Nice thing is a lot of stations, a lot of operations are switching over to SIMTPTP for their timing instead of color burst and things like that. This is compatible. It's very easy to translate between PTP and what's being used in ATSC. So benefits, IP transport. <clears throat> it's not an independent silo anymore. You can take adv uh, advantage of the evolution speed of the internet. Broadcast and broadband become peer delivery mechanisms. You can create new types of hybrid services. You're able to seamlessly incorporate niche content. Big thing is enabling new business models. Uh, one key thing is ad insertion. Dynamic ad insertion can represent a lot of economic value. Broadcast has been able, unable to take advantage of this. Everyone in the broadcast area sees the same ad by the nature of the way broadcast had operated. Uh, the ideal is to be able to do localized ad insertion in the home. In MPEG-2 transport, this is extremely difficult. A receiver able to do ad insertion in the compressed domain is far more expensive than anybody would ever spend for a TV. Ad insertion using segmented delivery is simply, I'm um, oversimplifying, but it's really only a matter of changing the next file in the playlist. Instead of playing this one, start playing that one. It is now possible to do that in almost every device. Uh, so this opens a new revenue model for broadcasters that was previously unavailable. Uh, this could be a very, very big deal. Uh, so if we look at the chart I put up at the beginning, what do we need for transport? I'm doing a little bit of a comparison here between 3.0 and 1.0. So again, DTV, whether it's 1.0 or 3.0 or 4.0 or whatever, it's numerous objects and streams. That's not going to change. No implication here. Uh, segmenting into usable size pieces. Well, ATSC3, it's being done with IP packets instead of MPEG2 TS packets. Again, reassemble them. Associate components with services. What, what packet belongs to what? <coughs> MPEG, it's done with what's called a PID packet identifier. Each packet has a PID, you know, which are the video, which are the audio, you just reassemble the streams. In ATSC3 IP, there's no PIDs, but you do have IP addresses and ports, and they're used in exactly the same way as the PIDs. So familiar mechanisms just using different elements. Uh, need to synchronize. So instead of establishing a timeline based on PCRs, recreating the encoder, uh, now everything knows exactly what time it is, universal time. So all of the requirements are being met, but they're just being met by somewhat different mechanisms, but hopefully not unfamiliar mechanisms to people designing receivers. Uh, so we're trying to be IP friendly. Uh, I think it's pretty clear the future is IP. So ATSC3 is embracing it fully. With that, thank you. And again, questions at the end.